Um, we are so, so excited to have a portion of our expert panel with us today. We're going to go ahead and dive in. Her Health Collective hosts four roundtables each year in an effort to bring together our experts and dive deep into topics that matter to moms the most. We have found that these roundtables are often our most well-liked and well-received episodes. Each of the experts in our roundtables have different professional backgrounds and specialties. And when they come together to discuss women's health or topics like what we're speaking about today, you can expect to get different perspectives based on their area of focus. This is also a time for our experts to collaborate with professionals from other industries in order to create a more holistic model of care for women. Our goal is to expand collaborative healthcare for women. In our roundtable today, we are discussing the topics of oppression, bias, inclusivity, and becoming allies. As parents, it is up to us to begin to have these conversations with our children in order to break the patterns of historic and ongoing oppression, which we are hearing about every day in the news now. Today, we are honored to be joined by several of our 2023 Her Expert panelists we are going to take a few moments to let each of them briefly introduce themselves and share their area of expertise so that our listeners who cannot see their these wonderful beautiful faces can hear each of our experts voices and hopefully have a better idea of who is speaking during the upcoming conversation so just in the order that is on my screen i'm going to call it a name and if you could just pop off mute and and let our listeners hear you and share who you are aaron i'm aaron bowdy I have a background in human development and behavior change and organizational psychology, and I use uh, a framework of personality to help make identity-related behavior change and habits for female entrepreneurs. Thank you, Erin. Dr. Sharice? I am Dr. Sharice Johnson. I'm a licensed clinical therapist in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm the founder of Jade Integrative Counseling an integrative practice where we see individuals, couples, and families from ages 13 and above. I'm also an author and a speaker and an OG here at Harold Health Collective. So I am so excited to be here. Yay, and we love our OG, Dr. Sharice. Um, next up, we have Latasha. Latasha Ralph, and I am here in Raleigh, North Carolina. I am the owner of Birth Sisters Dual Services, where I care for pregnant women and their families as they prepare for a birth um, and in the postpartum. I have also been working with healthcare systems on quality improvement. So we do have a lot of the talk around bias and how that impacts healthcare. So I will be offering some of that today for sure. Thank you, Latasha. Jessica? Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Jessica Shields. I am here in Southern California, bright and early. I am the founder and CEO of Stronger Minds, Stronger Youth, and I am a licensed educational psychologist and a school psychologist, and I work to help parents build their child's confidence and also navigate complex systems in the education system. So Again, a lot of bias when we talk about education and uh, teaching and learning and um, looking at those disparities. So I'll be able to share about that today. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Maris? Hi, I'm Maris Feely. I'm a co-owner of Carolina Birth and Wellness, which is a holistic resource center supporting families at every step of their reproductive health care journeys. So we cover everything from fertility to birth, postpartum, parenting, I'm also myself a practicing full spectrum doula supporting families that kind of any and all of those steps. So definitely looking forward to today's issue and the way that this weaves through you know, the entire reproductive healthcare experience. Thank you, Maris. And last, but certainly not least, we have Kirsten. Hi, my name is Kirsten and I am the um, owner of the perinatal pelvis in Hillsborough, North Carolina where I provide um, pelvic floor therapy and maternal wellness. And I work to help women feel strong, confident, and functional in their bodies while receiving holistic and compassionate care. And this topic today just rings so true um, to what I strive to do in bringing awareness to how women deserve to have care in the healthcare system. Thanks, Kirsten. Well, 
her health collective is not known to shy away from difficult conversations. We like to bring it to our community straight and have these conversations. And this is no different. Today is a difficult topic to talk about. We will be tackling unknown biases and talking about being an inclusive family of allies in a country with historic and ongoing oppression. Oppression is often defined as the social act of placing severe restrictions on an individual group or institution. This often causes prolonged cruel or unjust treatment or control and is a combination of prejudice and institutional power. In an article from the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is titled Social Identities and Systems of Oppression, it states, quote, we are all assigned multiple social identities, whether we are aware of it or not. Within each category, there is a hierarchy, a social status with dominant and non-dominant groups. A person of the non-dominant group can experience oppression in the form of limitations, disadvantages, or disapproval. The article goes on to say, in the United States, systems of oppression, like systemic racism, are woven into the very foundation of American culture, society, and laws. Other examples of systems of oppression are sexism, heterosexism, ableism, classism, ageism, and anti-Semitism. Even though this is a difficult topic, it is important to have open discussions in order to develop a deeper understanding of the issues and dismantle the systems of oppression. How are you seeing historical oppression being reflected in the industry that you are in? I will say in my industry of uh, maternal child health, I see it in the, the hospitals where if I run into a person of color that's working there, they really do have a hard time uh, getting their point across. The people who I work with, who are mostly women of color, have a really hard time being seen and heard. And I think um, that is something that pers has persisted and probably will persist for a while in healthcare. Latasha, have you seen it influence your mission of what you strive to do with your work? It can. Uh, I try to safeguard against it as much as I can with, uh, you know, prep work and having people understand what the stats are and the disparities, having people understand that sometimes you need to actually do some research on your own. You can't rely fully on every word. You have to understand uh, healthcare for yourself and for your situation. And I would have to say it's pretty clear in the field of education. We can pull up numbers right now across the nation. We can look at achievement for children of color, English language learners, uh, compared to white and Asian counterparts even. And we can already see those, dis those disparities. We can see the disparities in discipline rates, you know? And I, I always tell people, I say, you know what? Uh, the black population is number one in all the bad statistics because you can pull it up and you can see. And in, in my industry, you know, it's hard getting that point across that it's not the child, it's the system that is set up to have these disparities it's the systems it's the resistant to change for education some people don't want to deal with their own bias some people would rather just teach the way they've been teaching do the things that they have been doing and not change at all because they're okay they're doing fine but the change is the hard part and then really just looking at yourself and how you're practicing is where I see that resistance. And there is a lot <laughs> of resistance. And uh, again, we have the numbers to prove that something else needs to happen. But the underlying piece is the bias, is the racism, is how we're, um, how we're doing business in schools. So that's definitely clear across the nation. Now, Jessica, being in the educational system, have you, has it shaped your approach to how you are doing your work and did it does it shape your choice of entry into the field that you're in 
Well, as a person who does work in schools, definitely it shapes everything that I do. I do a lot of assessments for special education. Talk about ableism. Talk about looking at a child's label and a teacher already making assumptions and already treating that child as if they can't do something because they see a label. And sometimes the labels aren't true. So, you know, just having that bias instantly. So what I do is because I do a lot of assessments and I get a lot of referrals often of English language learners, I have to be careful with the assessments that I choose. I have to make sure that I'm choosing assessments that are going to not be uh, so language loaded, so culturally loaded, so that I can get the best out of that child. And if they're not disabled, then I'm not going to you know, label them disabled, it could be language acquisition. So I have to be extra careful about the tools that I choose. And it definitely shapes everything that I do and how I help parents navigate the school systems as well. I also see an element of all of those things in the mental health field, right? When it comes to much of what Latasha and Jessica were talking about and others can probably resonate with the biggest overtone of historical oppression has been judgment, has been labeling, which allows for your denied full participation. So because this is who the world believes you are, or this is who the system that you're in believes you are, we're going to pull you out of here and we're going to do X, Y, Z. Yes, there are certain times and situations where that may be beneficial, but it also creates and adds to children, young adults, adults feeling othered. And it adds to people going, well, I don't want to let someone know that something's wrong with me because I don't want to be seen that way. And as a result in mental health, I believe people then minimize or dismiss or not want to change and address the things that would be helpful to them, but also because it hasn't been taught to them in the right way. Um, I am a former educator, and I remember one of the things that I would constantly see as I was working with families around fourth or fifth grade was students would come to me labeled as oppositionally defiant. Whereas now that I'm in the mental health field, I can look back and go, they were experiencing adverse childhood experiences and impacted by trauma. And as a result, didn't have the developmental skills to know how to self-regulate when they were in an environment that was dysregulated and their parents weren't getting that information. And a lot of these various systems don't work together. So we kind of symptom check and label a child this way. And then once you get under that label, it creates a domino for a lot of people that you begin to identify. If this is what people believe about me, why try? So it definitely resonates how I want to or has definitely impacted the way I want to show up in the mental health field, which is why I get out of my office. And I do a lot of work in the community with school systems, with universities, at new stations, anywhere that's open, I want to bridge that gap so that we can know about the resources and and help people understand that there's always a bigger picture than that one behavior that you see that is now kind of a weight on the person who it's being projected towards. And I think a lot of times people don't know what they don't know. Racism is like air. We breathe it. We experience it. But we don't know it's there all the time. So as as a person, you know, as a as a white person, as a person that hasn't grown up in this culture, even um, I think it's important for people to be exposed and to hear some of the experiences that people are having and also be educated on what bias is. And typically when you say bias, people think about the person who's, um, you know, screaming the N word at someone or someone who's, you know, blatantly displaying racism. But a lot of times it's very subtle. It is how people are seen in that moment. Uh, the judgment that happens and it's those little moments that matter the most um they they really do shape how people experience things and the care that they get so I, I want people to recognize that while we talk about bias we're not talking about the type that 
you know, anybody could see. We're talking about those moments when you decide that a resource is not not going to be given to someone because they may not be able to afford it because they're black. Like all of those things go together for people sometimes. Um, we're talking about when people decide that it's not worth it to go the extra mile for someone because they're of a certain color, right? They don't always know they're doing it. They don't know they're always doing it. So uh, another thing for people to think about is always have a way to make sure someone else understands what's happening. So when for me, I always tell people, when you go to your doctor's appointments, you go with someone. If you can't take someone, take your phone and have it on speaker. Let someone else hear it. Because in your upset, you may even miss some of it and not recognize, oh, wow, I didn't even know it happened that way. I didn't even recognize it in the moment. And then somebody can help you navigate and recognize what's, what's really going on. And I want to say that Latasha brought up a good point. Uh, I did teach a class at the university for uh, upcoming school psychologists, and we it was a class based on culturally responsive, basically assessments and bias, so looking at your own biases. And one thing that all the students had to do at the very beginning was take the Harvard Implicit Association test. That is a good start to uncover some of your unconscious bias, because Latasha just talked about that unconscious piece. Sometimes you don't even know that it's happening. And so I think it's so important that we work to even uncover some of the unconscious bias that, that we may have, all of us, whether it's um, based on race or based on ability level, whatever it may be. But that is a really good assessment to start with. And it's free and it gives you a lot of good feedback. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yes, to all of that. I think I also want to lift up as a white doula and like birth worker in this field that I think sometimes too, it's very easy for folks working to disrupt these institutions to also feel like we aren't supposed to do or we're not really a part of that, right? And not having to examine that implicit bias. And also that, well, that racism was something that happened, right? Like, well, what does that have to do with me? I think a lot of white folks distance themselves from the history of white supremacy and the way that, that it's internalized within our fields. And I'll say at least for like birth workers in this field, I would definitely point people to um, Dr. Dorothy Roberts' book, Killing the Black Body, which is a deep dive history into the way that reproductive health care in particular is rooted and founded in a lot of control, coercion, oppression, particularly of Black women in this country. And that as a white doula or white birth worker, anyone in this field, I think everyone, to your point, um, has internalized oppressions to examine. But I think I'll say for myself and informing our perspective at Carolina Birth and Wellness, it's doing that work with us first and recognizing that it's all interconnected, right? Or Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality, that all of these identities are in the room with us um, and that to really support women and families and parents. It's not just about to any of these one-off issues, right? It's not just about birth or it's not just about postpartum or you know their children going into schools, but it's you know reproductive justice. And to define that, it's you know the right to maintain personally personal bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, to parent those children in safe and sustainable ways. And so fighting that internalized oppression and unlearning that and fighting that within these institutions really weaves through all of these issues and weaves through the schools that our children are in or our OB appointments or our prenatal care or mental health care. And so I think that's very much informing our mission and something that I just want to really lift up for white folks in this field too, when it comes to unlearning and battling racial oppression. Maris, have you seen it shape your approach to the way that you do your work? It sounds like you have started educating yourself more, but has it done anything for the way you practice being a doula, the way you run your business, um, your choice of entry into the field you're in? I think to lift up really uh, Latasha's points, right? It, a lot of it comes down to understanding how it looks and kind of insisting on witnessing and lifting up witnessing the way that this happens. 
And so that can look like everything from lifting up Black doulas or providers of color or folks in this field that have lived experience, whether it's, I mean, even when it comes to racism or, you know, different abilities or ableism or class, um, you know, centering the voices, I think, first and foremost of lived experience. But then also, I think to your point of making sure at least like as a practicing doula that our patients or clients, you know, bearing witness to their experiences thus far, and also making sure that we are willing to unlearn, I would say, internal values of white supremacy in order to protect and empower patients as well. Um, so an example of this, I loved like having someone with you for OB appointments that you mentioned, Latasha. And I think another example I would say of like in birth work is that a very functional example is that um, pain is very layered in identity. And I feel like I heard echoes of that in Dr. Johnson's words too, in the way that we are believing people in their experiences. Um, and when it comes to like labor and delivery, the reporting of pain is very layered and coded in medical racism. And so the way that we're taking pain seriously and ensuring that our patients have access to the support the medicine, the care that they deserve and need based on what they are reporting, feeling in their bodies is, I would say, just like a really clear cut example of how needing to have like an anti-racist lens and an informed lens going into this field or in this work um, to ensure that we are supporting our patients in what they need. And I mean, with the maternal mortality crisis, uh, you know, saving lives to a degree too. So, I mean, that's even a whole larger conversation, but I think examples of how like, it's one thing to do the internal theory work and it's another to be like, how does this look in practice? And I think not excluding ourselves as white birth workers or repro health workers as not as being a part of that system. I think it's really easy for me to be like, well, I'm not an OB, I'm not a doctor. I don't have like the power in this scenario, but it's like, I'm still coming into the room with white privilege and with internalized white supremacy and where am I in the system and how am I disrupting that within myself and within the room. Thanks, Maris. We're going to move now into discussing the development of biases and how they've been passed down through generations. And we're also going to talk about the way biases continue to affect the people that you're working with. The article we cited earlier mentions that an effective way to begin having difficult conversations and move towards advancements that will break through oppression is by looking at and understanding how each of us has been socialized to play certain roles. There's a diagram made up of three arrows, three circles, and a core center. And we will be putting all of this in the show notes. So listeners, you'll have access to all that we're, we're discussing. This is called the cycle of socialization, which describes how our biases, ideas, beliefs, and behaviors are developed. These biases, such as preferences in favor of certain people, groups, things, or against certain people, groups, or things, then reinforce the cycle of oppression. We are born without biases, but we all have them and they've developed and they are all part of humans. The ways we are affected by issues of oppression, the messages we receive from institutions and culture, as well as the choices we make, continue to maintain an oppressive system based upon power. Getting clear on our conscious and unconscious biases and how they are rooted in inaccurate information or reason and are potentially harmful is important. So let's talk now about the biases that exist within your industries. What are some common biases that you hear from the women that you treat? And are there specific biases associated within your professional field of expertise? I'd love to jump in on this from a framework of identity and personality and behavior. We understand in personality psychology that a lot of 
the behaviors that we develop are protective out of childhood development. And so much of the tools that get created around assessing behavior or personality or identity are primarily focused through the lens of white, cisgendered, educated men, right? And so these measurement tools, while held up by empirical science in some flimsy way, right, lack the depth of perspective that captures the human condition and it misses trauma and oppression and gender and access and ability and disability and neurodivergence. And yet we hold them up, especially in academic and business and you know, psychology industries as the standard and often these more nuanced tools or perspectives get filtered off because they can't follow this scientific rigor. And so I think that bias, I'm, I'm a PhD candidate, I love science, and also like it's, as Maris said, our work in as a privileged body to disrupt that work and bring in more perspective and more voices. Um, and so I see it wholeheartedly in my work um, when people want, I use the Enneagram as a tool, um, when people wanna understand their personality or their identity better. A lot of folks that I work with that don't fit into this you know, accessible body, this white male view um, can't find themselves easily. And we've conditioned them to believe it's them and not the tool. And so I think really questioning the tool becomes a more effective strategy. Last night, I actually was able to be a part of the Below the Belt film um, in Chapel Hill. If you haven't heard about this, please go and watch it. But it follows four women that experience um, pelvic pain and endometriosis and their journeys through finding healthcare. So on average, it takes 10 years for somebody to get diagnosed with endometriosis. And the research in this country is very, like the money that's going towards research um, for a female only diagnosis is very small compared to for example, diabetes um, is like $1 billion going to research for that diagnosis where it's the same prevalence. So one in every nine women in the world experience endometriosis, and that's the same amount that experience diabetes. And so it, it just sheds light on how we don't look at women in the same way and how then we add on taboo topics like um, painful periods and painful sex and these issues that are happening in high school and college age females that get discredited when they go and seek medical care. Um, they get diagnosed with GI issues or it's something else and it's never something that has to deal with them as their female body. So it's a great awareness in terms of where those biases live, even in through our healthcare system. And I see that in my practice a lot is a lot of people um, just searching for answers and not getting the answers that they really want and therefore not getting the care that they need. So, well, thank you for participating in that film. I'm sure that that was a way for you to help challenge and bring to light the negative and harmful biases within the, your clients and the country. So thank you for, for doing that. I'll say um, in, in my field of being a doula, I find that uh, a lot of people don't recognize that there are tools that people use to determine whether or not a person is favorable for a vaginal delivery. And they, they do some checks and they put the information into uh, a calculator that anybody can Google. And when they put it in, there is a uh, on uh, some of them, there are questions of race. And if you put in the same stats and you change the race, the favorability changes. So baked into the tool, it says that you're not as likely to have a vaginal birth if you are Black. Um, and you can clearly see it. And so understanding that it's not just the people, 
it's the, the tools, as were mentioned, that are being used. And those tools were created by people who are growing up in a society where the default is white. We're not the default. The default is white. The default is white. And so recognizing that I think is important because people don't think that far. They don't know that it even exists, but it's impacting care every day. Latasha, how do we, uh, like we had just talked about with, with Kirsten, how do we challenge the negative or harmful biases with, within our clients as well as within ourselves? I think uh, the, the test is helpful because a lot of people find out that they're not as, as inclusive as they thought they were when they take the test. I think everyone needs to get out of their bubble and it's easy to tell. So a lot of times I can hear people in conversations like this who are devoted to the cause, but let me see your Facebook page. Who are you talking to? Who's at your house? Who's going on field trips? Who are your kids playing with? They look just like you. <laughs> so we got to get to a place where we recognize that we need to have people intermingle. We got to get there. If we can't get there, it's just talk until we get there. Right. I will say this also, as far as kids go around four or five, they start noticing. Right. They know who's the cat and who's the mouse. Right. You can't hide it from them. If you don't have the discussion, it starts there. And when you wait until they're teenagers to have this discussion, they've already digested so much information that tells them where they are on this totem pole and how people are to be treated on this totem pole that is very difficult to make a dent. And they're carrying that all their lives. And I've had people say to me, you know, how do I make sure my child's not racist? And I'm like, honey, but then. <laughs> how do you make it better <laughs> how do you make it better because they have been taught you know they're, they're reading the books they're seeing the movies they're you know in an environment that says they are the default that's a, that's a lot of privilege to hold and so it takes conscious effort every day to help make that better to help make them see things through a different lens because they're getting fed it and they can't help it. They're in this environment. Like I said, it's the air. So it, it's, a, it's a conscious effort. You have to really work at it for everybody, not just the kids, you know, but I think it's, it's very impactful when I see people not just do one training and know it all, not just read a book. You have to continuously feed yourself this diet of something different from what you're being, you're absorbing every day. I have to agree with Latasha. She just brought up so many things that kind of triggered my memory. <laughs> um, I think about what's going on in Florida. You know, there's this ban against uh, teaching Black history. Like, what is going on? <laughs> you know? Um, and then I think about everything that you said, Latasha, and it reminds me of the book White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. Great book. I highly recommend it. Now, if it's too much for you to swallow, then you already know you're not ready for change yet because that is a tough book to read and you have to be open to have that type of dialogue and to and to listen to someone else's perspective so that's the first thing but when you were talking i was thinking about how we have so many barriers if you think about your anybody here if you think about the books you read in sixth grade seventh grade maybe eighth grade right maybe you read books like where the red fern grows, or you might have read uh, the, the Outsiders, right? So those are the popular books. But think about in your own education, the books that were highlighted and chosen, whose story was being told? And if it was To Kill a Mockingbird, was that really a story that highlighted empowerment in the Black community? No, it did not. So if you think about even that, even on that level, it's so subtle. The books that we even choose in the curriculum, whose story is being told, and then what is being considered the standard, and whose story is not being told. So even the subtleness of that can make an impact on how kids see themselves, how they see their peers who are not white, 
how they see the world. So all of that is a trickle effect. So thank you for uh, kind of jogging my memory about that. So I just wanted to share. Thank you so much, Jessica. We have, in this first half of this conversation, we've walked through oppression and we've walked through bias. I'd like us to turn us now towards allyship. According to Dr. Nico White, allyship is a process where you are building relationships upon trust, consistency, and accountability with those marginalized identities you seek to support and empower. There's also a wonderful definition from the Corporate Sisters. An ally is an individual involved in the promotion and advancement of an inclusive culture through positive and intentional action. If you are a true ally, you're not just someone who has the sentiment of, I believe that equality, justice, dignity, and respect should be provided to this group of people or identity, but you stand in solidarity with those marginalized people. That simple shift looks very different and provides a much greater impact. What does it look like in today's world for a person to stand in solidarity with marginalized people? What does allyship look like for you personally and within your industry as a whole? I'll tackle the personal uh, piece. So typically, I have so many friends that are allies. Uh, white friends that are allies they they make sure you know they are protective even on social media if someone says something I don't have to <laughs> they're gonna get it um I have uh you know people that I work with that are allies but you know those a lot of times they name themselves and for me the ally is someone that I chose, right? So there is that for the personal thinking about it. Like you may see yourself as an ally, but it may take time for the person that, or the group that you're working with to see you as an ally. That's a different process. And so you have to be chosen for that because it takes, it takes breaking, building trust. And I think in the professional world, you know, that also rings true, but in a different way. So I'm just looking to make sure that you're not going to block me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we don't have to go to dinner. It would be great, but we don't have to go to dinner. I just need to know that in that space, you allow me to operate fully. You're good. Anything else is gravy. I also think it's important to recognize that our allyship can be performative. So there are times and situations where people may believe they're an ally because they have a good heart or they go, we intentionally give money towards organizations that help marginalize people groups, but yet it's not a lifestyle. It's not something that they live. So, you know, when we talk about that concept of believing that someone is genuinely an ally, it's someone that you know regardless of whether or not we even believe the same, they're going to support you. And the whole concept in my mind of solidarity means that you support, have worked through your unconscious bias to the point where you're a little bit uncomfortable, right? Because solidarity is typically going to call you to come out of your comfort zone and go, can I stand up when what needs to be said or what needs to happen is different? from what's happening, you know? So again, people can call themselves allies. And I often see whether it's in mental health, whether it's in corporations, even local entrepreneurs or mothers who will highlight groups of women that all look the same. Um, and these are people that I might know, and I think that's really wonderful, but you still elevated voices that all look like you you can see events and I just, I watch this way and you'll notice that, oh, here's an event that occurred and like, they're all white women. They're all wearing similar dresses and sneakers. Like there's these waves of different untold aspects of what's happening there. And while their heart is in an incredible place, I had this conversation with an organization. I said, you don't have any diversity on your planning team. So there's a lot of allyship and solidarity that isn't true in nature because the people who are actually spearheading and bringing forth the mission 
still all look like you. So you're not going to have diverse perspectives, you know, at the table. And I see that in mental health as well, um, where things are elevated by white cisgender males because they're predominantly who is what started the field of mental health. And it often shies away so that if there is something focused on people of color or LGBTIQ or queer identity, it's separate. Like, oh, we'll do it because it's queer month or Black History Month. So also noticing, are we only going into these conversations at certain times of year because then we feel more comfortable? Or how often is this weaved into everything that we do and say? Because I see it in the patients that I work with, and I will say where I'm seeing it most is in the young patients that I work with, in the high schoolers and the young adults who are very aware of what's happening and really struggling with, I'm looking at my parents in different ways, or I don't feel prepared to go be in a world because I was so shielded that I am fragile heading into this new space because I don't know how to have conversations and I feel uninformed and that impacts their ability to grow in their own identity as well. I agree with Dr. Johnson. Um, There has to be this intentionality. And one thing that one of the school districts I'm affiliated with here in California is doing is they're training administrators and teachers in this uh, concept of, first of all, recognizing when you are in a situation that might uh, provoke fragility, right? And recognizing when something is said that's not quite right, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, then interrupting that type of thought process that might be just based in bias and assumptions about a group of people, but then going back to repair and restore that relationship. So they call it this RIR model. So you recognize what's happening. You interrupt that negative or that uh, falsehood of thought process. And then you work intentionally to restore or repair in some way that relationship or that conversation. And it may not all happen in one sitting, but it may take, you know, it may happen over time. But saying, hey, if you're an ally, you're gonna be willing to step out of your comfort zone when you hear someone say something is wrong. Um, or that's bias, or that's uh, racist in nature, or whatever it may be, you're going to interrupt that and call it out. And you're going to call it out because you're intentional about changing uh, the way people are trying to uh, get people to understand a different way of thinking. I'll say one last thing. I very rarely see white-bodied individuals interrupting. It is still typically us interrupting And then we get a little message or a side DM or a phone call that says, I completely agree, but you weren't brave enough to interrupt in the moment. I completely agree, but you'll tell me something in secret on a post, but won't say the same thing that you said to me in secret right there at the bottom of the page to balance the narrative. So that's solidarity. Solidarity means Your pat on the back is great, but I didn't need it in my DM. I need you to show up on the wall the same way you're showing up on other places because when we are the interrupters and the disruptors, that adds to the stigma. That adds to Black women are too much. They're always demanding because we're the only people saying what everybody thinks, but no one else wants to say. So there is a level of privilege and white women as a whole sit back and allow us to carry that load Mm -hmm. because it's comfortable. And I know that's hard to hear. Just give it thought. I, I echo, I mean, that's so important to hear as a white bodied privileged woman, you know, uh, Latasha, what you said earlier about, it's not my position to say that I'm an ally, right? That's, it's, I'm not the expert in allyship. And 
I recognize so much in my work and in myself how Im how important somatically this work is, because if I want to be somebody who stands in solidarity, not in recognition, but in disruption, right? Somebody who's willing to use my privileged body to be a in front of it, I have to manage the discomfort somatically. And there is a lot of, you know, connected trauma that we have to dismantle and a lot of things that uh, live within our nervous system that have to be addressed. And the only way we are, it, from my perspective, I wanna be an accomplice more than an ally. Like I wanna be part of the breaking it down. I better know how to manage my body in order to do that work. And so I appreciate you saying that because um, I think more white women need to do that work so that they can be the disruptors in front, not behind. And start small. I mean, you have to work your way into it. So start small. Start with every time you hear someone uh, talk over a, a person, uh, make sure you say, oh, I, I think I heard such and such say that. Start small. And then your next step could be um, if you hear someone say things, and I, I I just had this happen in a meeting. I had some I heard someone say, well, you know, if the test scores are changing, we're more diverse than we were before. Hey, hold on, what did you just say? Did you hear did you hear what you just said? The test scores went down because we're more diverse. I don't think you meant that. People don't know what they're thinking, and sometimes it comes out and you get an opportunity. So you can say, I don't think you meant that. I think this is what I heard. Is that what you meant? You can start small with things like that. And then you'll get to the point where you're able to recognize more of what microaggressions are, because sometimes that's how it shows up. And um, I find that until someone says something, people don't even recognize it was a microaggression because that's exactly a macroaggression. That's exactly what it is. And so start small. Um, as you see those examples, then you're able to respond to them more and don't shy away from it. You have so much power you don't even recognize. If I had it, oh my God, where would I be if I had the power you have, right? Going into all of that, right? White folks seem to be coming for white folks. And like, I think someone mentioned in the chat as well, bringing like gender into the conversation, the LGBTQ population, I think being an ally too means not only interrupting, but also I think Jessica, you were saying that third R, right? Of how are we going to repair the situation and that as allies or co-conspirators or you know, whatever word we wanna use, we don't get to set the terms of that. And I think that sometimes is really hard for people to not realize that, I mean, just like in any relationship, if someone commits a wrong, like. I don't get to tell you how I get to make it up to you, right? Like we have to listen to the populations. And I think some of that too means redefining our definitions of conflict or of these identities, because I think a big thing I see in reproductive healthcare too right now and in general is also this definition of women and how we derive power from that word and whether or not that's inclusive of trans women who are women and you know, non-binary folks and even just using language like birthing parents or pregnant people and feeding into that like straight or cis women need to use that language too in some of these spaces or when we're having these conversations as well because we need to make sure that we're modeling, right? That behavior and that inclusion and calling in folks who do share our identities, however uncomfortable doing that work that Erin mentioned, right, of like sitting somatically in the body and getting uncomfortable with it, recognizing that however uncomfortable I could be as a white cis woman is never going to be the violence being committed against a trans woman or a black woman. And that it doesn't compare that the need to interrupt and then to listen to these populations on how we can repair the work and the history that's happening um, and that has happened. Thank you so much for that. I heard so much powerful insights in that 
part of our conversation about allyship, specifically this idea that we need to be intentional and that we have to be prepared to be uncomfortable. And it really comes down to what we're doing every day. It's the little small things that we do. It's not performative. It, it's actually standing up and saying something in these little small moments. And I think those are such important lessons for us to, to tuck away and to take with us as we are moms. And, and that's a big piece of who our audience is. It's largely comprised of moms. And as is typical of most moms, our biggest concern tends to be on raising our children to be good humans. And I know that our Mama Needs a Moment listeners and more generally the Her Health Collective community will equate being a good human with allyship and inclusiveness. So um, as I, I was thinking about this topic of raising our children to be inclusive and to be an ally, I was reminded of a time when I was in, I believe, third grade, and I was shown a video, and it, it was the civil rights movement, and there were a group of Black people, and the fire hoses were being turned on them. And this was my first time being exposed to this. And I remember sitting there in shock, and that's a whole other conversation, why was this the first time that I was exposed to this, but I was sitting there with a feeling of shock. I felt an overwhelming feeling of guilt, and I remember thinking that I hated those white people. Nobody helped me figure out what to do with those feelings. I didn't know what to do with that guilt that I felt. I didn't know what to do with that hate that I felt towards these people who are being horrible to another group of people. And I just sat with it and I felt very uncomfortable, but I had no direction. And I don't want that to happen to my daughter. I want her to grow up with this inclusive allyship just built into her bones. I want to do everything I can at least to make that happen. So what does it look like for a mom to raise her child, to be inclusive, to be an ally? Are these direct lessons? Is it something that is infused, as we said before, in our daily habits of life? Um, what tips and suggestions can you offer for moms to be able to put this into action for her family? Do life with people that do not look like you. That is foundational. When we're siloed, in and everything we see and experience looks just like us, that's what allows the narrative to come from media, from what you see in school, from the books you read, because there's nothing creating that story and narrative. When your child from infancy grows up in diverse spaces and does life with diverse spaces, not we go feed homeless people at Thanksgiving or a few times a year, we do things for underprivileged. We go once a year and go to another country and take a picture of ourselves with a, a child of a different color. Not saying those things aren't great, but that's not going to help your child be a good human. It creates this, look, here's what I do. So I'm okay. When you do life with someone that isn't like you, you have a completely different perspective of what it means to walk in their shoes. You see where our blood is all the same color, but you also see where our skin creates different opportunities. And so then you're more likely to disrupt in those moments because you're not only speaking from a place of, I wanna work on this, but you're thinking of all of the amazing and incredible people in your life that you know that you're thinking if that happened to so-and-so, I would be upset. So I'm not going to stand back and not do anything now. That's very hard to develop much later on in life. And for if we think about the developmental growth of children, it is much easier to develop when they're younger. So parents have a tendency to shy away from tough conversations, the world does not. So someone said it earlier, if you don't have these conversations, the world and their peers will have them for you. From birth to seven, children assimilate the foundation of what they believe about life. From seven and beyond, you're just working to go, what did I not 
give them. So introducing this at 14 because you think they're ready is actually too late. Those early years when they're very young, you are teaching them empathy. You are teaching them how to be in different spaces with different people. You are teaching them, yes, her hair is different. Do not touch it. She did not walk up and touch your hair. Do not walk up and touch her hair. Yes, it's different, you know, and let's now go talk about that since you're curious. And then we can talk about what that's like and why you don't want to touch somebody's hair because you don't want to touch anybody without permission. So it is a combination of doing life, having conversations and being intentional about sharing these things to and with your children, because if you don't, that is a privilege. Um, I, I did a podcast several years ago with some other white bodied moms and we like went all in and we talked about the fact that I was like, I don't have the privilege of letting my child run freely. Like my son will be judged for being busy where your white son won't. If he can't go to school and sit still, it has consequences for him. So I have to be harder and tougher on him. If we as parents wait to extend those things to our kids until they're 12, 13, 14, the level of privilege is so rooted. It's not impossible, but it's a lot more challenging to uproot. So really ask yourself, what does the diversity in our friends look like? When we get together with our favorite people, how many moms do I know that I don't work with? that aren't just at my child's dance class or sports, do I invite them to our house? Do I know where they live? Do I know how many other children that they have? Do I know what they do? Do I even know their last name? We have to do life together. We have to. And I just wanna piggyback on, on that. That was beautiful, Dr. Johnson. I just wanna say also the literature in your home, make sure it's diverse. Um, make sure that the toys are diverse. It's okay to have the black Barbie, you know, as long and, and the white Barbie and the and a Latina Barbie. Um, just making sure that it's it's normalized, normalizing the diversity and embracing it, and not always calling it out. Oh well, let's get the black doll. Oh, she's cute. Let you like this one? I like her dress. You know, not always having to call out, but normalizing it as if it's just a part of life like everyone. So I would say again, the, liter the literature in your home and also the, the toys or the representation in other aspects as well. I will say point out beauty where you see it. You don't know what it means to a child to hear you are beautiful, period. You don't know what it means to a mother to say, I, you know, I, I love your outfit, if it's not something you would wear, even though you love it. Just think about ways that you can compliment people that are different from you and let your kids see you doing it. You also can recognize that when you are looking at these books and a lot of it can be histor historical content that may be challenging. Okay, that's good, but they also need to see some joy. They need to see some regular black people in movies living their life. They need to see some books that talk about things other than civil rights. It's, it, you know, the full spectrum of a person um, I think is important. I had to do that with my own kids. I had to make sure that when we talk about in Black History Month, it's not all dead people. There's some living people <laughs> that are contributing to history. Um, and then also I had to make sure I got my people around different types of people, you know, and in this neighborhood that I'm in, we have so many, we have so many cultures, so many different people. Um, and so they've got friends in our neighborhood. That was a bonus, right? So I kind of got it easy on that point. But then you have to think about um, recognizing that they don't, they might see a person and not understand a culture. So go into culture with them and understand that people don't all eat the same things and wear the same things and, and, and point it out to them and say, oh, isn't that fascinating? And make sure you take the time to, to help them to understand culture as well. Not every Black person is the same. Not every Indian person is the same. People have different perspectives as well. We're not a monolith. I think that's important. 
I think one tip that's helpful for parents in this active work is recognizing that we are our kiddos co-regulators and we are our kiddos co-dysregulators. So if we are uncomfortable uh, around topics of you know, difference or oppression, we are, our nervous system is going to teach our child's nervous system to be uncomfortable. I live in a disabled body and it's really easy for me to be comfortable in the world when my kids point to someone in a wheelchair and have a really natural conversation about ability and disability. But, you know, it's, it's that work in us to be their co-regulator around these you know, our differences and the things that we don't normalize as often as we should. And I just wanted to leave one more resource for parents who really want to make a difference in the child's education and in the education system. If you can get culturally responsive teaching in your schools, that will make a huge difference. And one book to start with it's culturally responsive teaching and the brain. And it talks about the regulation and dysregulation and, and how we can embed culture. And that's written by Zaretta Hammond. So I just wanted to leave that resource for parents who are uh, looking to change or change in the school districts. This has been such a powerful conversation. And I'm speaking for myself and I know, I know Chrissy and she feels the same. We're excited to share this with our community. Thank you so much for all of the insights, the thoughts, your wisdom that you've shared with our community on the topics of biases, inclusivity, allyship, and the systemic oppression that is within our country. We are really excited to continue collaborating with you this year and sharing your wisdom with the rest of our community. So thank you so much for everything. Yes, thank you.